you are about to watch an interview that I granted to the Polish clinical psychologist Daria Zhukowska. It is a fascinating interview, not because I'm in it, <laughs> also because I'm in it, but because it deals with aspects and facets of codependency which are rarely tackled. Codependency, codependency is also known in clinical psychology as dependent personality disorder. I thought it would help you to understand the interview if I were to provide you with an introduction in bullet point style. So here goes. Both narcissism and codependency involve a fantasy defense. Within the fantasy, the codependent has a dual role as both a parent, a parental figure, usually a maternal figure, a substitute mother, and a child. So she plays both roles. And this reflects her internal psychological structure. Because within the codependent, there's a punitive inner parent and a wounded inner child. They cohabit, they share the internal space of the codependent. The problem is that the codependent's inner parent feels betrayed when the codependent falls in love or develops a friendship or becomes reliant on someone or, or has intimacy. The inner parent feels abandoned, neglected, shunted aside and generally stabbed in the back. The inner parent then pushes the codependent to punish her newfound partner as a kind of loyalty test to placate the implacable inner parent. The codependent obliges and complies and she becomes, at least temporarily, somewhat abusive. But then, riven by guilt and shame, the codependent then punishes herself as well for having transgressed against her partner. And this is, of course, a borderline dynamic. This makes it very difficult to tell borderlines and codependents apart. Very often people with dependent personality disorder are misdiagnosed as borderline. Codependents and their intimate partners engage in co-regulation. Co-regulation, an external form of regulation. They merge, infuse, they create a symbiotic relationship. And within this symbiotic relationship, they offer each other regulatory functions. The intimate partner of the codependent regulates her emotions, her moods, and her, some of her cognitions and emotions, exactly as the intimate partner of the borderline does. Again, in this sense, the codependent is indistinguishable from the borderline. The codependent, exactly like the narcissist and the borderline, suffers from object inconstancy, separation, insecurity, also known as abandonment anxiety, and catastrophizing. She anticipates rejection, hurt, humiliation, abandonment, and neglect, and reacts to it, reacts to her own imagination as if it had already happened. The codependent seeks to attach to a secure base. She seeks to transform her intimate partner into a secure base. And she does this using three strategies. People-pleasing, catering to the needs of the intimate partner on a regular basis. Control from the bottom, a form of emotional blackmail. I can't live without you. I'm helpless without you. You owe me. I sacrifice things for you, etc., etc. So in, in her interactions with the external object, the codependent rules and controls the external object, but from the bottom, from a position of helplessness, from a position of neediness and clinginess. And finally, the third technique is aggression, directed at an internal object that represents the external object. By doing so, the codependent is able to avoid aggressing against the intimate partner. And so these are the techniques she uses. I say she because until recently the majority of people with codependency were women. 
Today we know that many men are codependent as well. The codependent outsources her ego functions, for example, reality testing. She converts her intimate partner into an externalized ego. And so, for example, when it comes to reality testing, she sees reality, she interacts with reality, she appraises reality, she evaluates reality only through the eyes of the intimate partner. She resorts to the intimate partner and asks him, for example, is this real? Is this true? Is this a fact? Should I believe that? Should I trust him? Should I trust someone? So he becomes her filter, her firewall, her interface with reality. And that's one example of one ego function. The codependent feels alive only when she is in a relationship. She maintains a vicarious life. She lives through the existence and the agency of her intimate partner. In solitude, she finds her constricted life intolerable. She loves herself by proxy through the gaze and agency of her intimate partner. You can see already the enormous similarities be behavioral similarities and psychodynamic similarities between borderline personality disorder and dependent personality disorder, which is one of the reasons that both diagnoses are now being contested and that a third approach would be to consider both of them the outcomes of complex trauma, adverse childhood experiences. But this is for another interview. These are the topics I'm going to discuss now with Daria Zhukovska. Enjoy. So hello everyone and hello professor, because today our guest is a professor Sam Vakin, the author of Malignant Self-Love Narcissism Revisited. Hello. Yes, hello. Thank you for having me again. Thank you for agreeing and thank you for your time, Sam. You're a very patient woman and very courageous <laughs> <laughs> to have me so many times. Am I? Am I? <laughs> yes, I think I'm courageous. Yes. Um, I have a couple of questions about dependent um, personality, because I can tell that, especially on a Polish background and a Polish, uh, you know, a community, we have... Mm, a lot of confusing things uh, around this personality, and I would like to uh, elaborate about that uh, with you, because who can explain us better than you about dependent personality and other personalities? Keep so, going, keep going, I like it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, so the first question is, Sam, where is the boundary to, to have needs and to be needy? Where is the healthy boundary? Well, uh, the codependent regulates her internal environment through the partner. This is known as external regulation. External regulation means that the emotions of the codependent, the moods, the moods of the codependent, and sometimes the thoughts, the thinking, the cognitions of the codependent depend critically on input from the intimate partner. Mm -hmm. And this is a pathology. Our internal world should not be determined by outside people, by external people. The codependent seeks to merge or to fuse or to become one, to create a symbiosis with the intimate partner. Mm -hmm. Because that way, she can outsource outsource what we call ego functions to the intimate partner. The intimate partner becomes her ego. The in intimate partner becomes a substitute for herself. Self. So it's as if she deactivates herself, she disables her ego, and from that moment on, the intimate partner becomes her ego, becomes herself. Mm -hmm. And but to accomplish this, she needs to grant the intimate partner total access to her mind, to her emotions, to her moods, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And, the, and she needs to give the intimate partner total power over her. So it's a position mm -hmm. of complete submissiveness, utter, complete domination by the intimate partner. Mm -hmm. 
even when the intimate partner, partner is healthy, not an abuser. Even then, the co-defendant forces her intimate partner to take over, to possess her, to own her. So this is the first thing that separates having needs, which is legitimate, from being needy or being clinging, this external regulation. The outsourcing of ego functions means that the intimate partner fulfills all the psychological processes that normally happen internally in healthy people. So for example, reality testing. Reality testing is an ego function. Our ability mm -hmm. to perceive reality appropriately, to evaluate it correctly, and to act in reality and on reality in a way that yields outcomes and results beneficial to us, this is known as self-efficacy, these are known together as reality testing. And the codependent, her reality testing is through the partner. So the mm -hmm. codependent views reality, evaluates reality, and acts in reality through the partner. The codependent is likely to ask the partner, is it true? Is this real? Do you think I should believe this? Do you think I should trust him? Do you think so? The judgment of the partner substitutes for the judgment of the of the codependent. And that's an example of outsourcing of ego functions. The, the codependents, codependent lives through the partner. She has a kind of vicarious life. Her life is through the partner. Only when she is with someone, she feels alive. When the codependent is alone, when the codependent is single, she feels dead. That's why she's depressed, she's dysfunctional. And so she, the codependent cannot stand being alone. She cannot stand solitude. And she lives her life through the agency of the intimate partner. And also she loves herself through the partner's eyes. She loves herself through the partner's gaze. She sees herself in the partner's eyes, in the partner's gaze, and she falls in love with herself through his gaze, through his eyes. To summarize this uh, very long answer, <laughs> the codependent is, as the name implies, dependent. Mm -hmm. Whereas a healthy person is not dependent. A healthy person is independent. A healthy person regulates his or her internal environment alone. A healthy person is capable of being in solitude, being solitary without any problem. A healthy person is um, judges reality by himself or herself. The codependent cannot do any of these things. She is like an extension of the intimate partner. She is a reflection of the intimate partner. She suspends her existence and her life and her autonomy, personal autonomy, and her independence, and her agency, she suspends all this. The minute she is with someone, she is a reflection. She is a shadow. She is no longer fully functional as a human being. Okay. Thank you for this answer. Even if it's uh, long, we need it. Definitely. Thank you. My second second question is, what does the internal dialogue of a dependent person uh, look like? How does she see herself? You already uh, answered that, right, through, through the guise of a partner, but how does the internal dialogue look like? That's a very interesting question, actually. First of all, uh, we must make a distinction. Codependent is not a clinical term. <clears throat> oh, yes. It's a popular term. It's like psychopath or sociopath. These are not clinical terms. And of course, empath, <laughs> the nonsensical empath. But this is not a clinical term. The clinical term is someone with dependent personality disorder, which is a personality yes. disorder in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And there is an equivalent in the ICD 11. So, um, someone with dependent personality disorder. It's not a question of being dependent on someone to do something for you. It's not mm -hmm. a question of being dependent on someone to have fun or to have money or to travel around the world or to make children together. Or It's not about 
it's not about anything external. The dependency is internal, not external. And so within the codependent, there is a war, there is a conflict going on between a, pa a parent and a child. The codependent, exactly like the narcissist, and exactly like the borderline, grows up usually within dysfunctional families where there's a lot of abuse, a lot of trauma, a lot of instrumentalization, parentification. Uh, the parents don't know how to raise the child appropriately. Or the mother is a, a, what we call a dead mother, metaphorically, a mother who is emotionally absent, who is depressive, who is selfish, and so on and so forth. The child, the child is not getting what the child needs. Is not getting the mother's gaze, is not getting the mother's presence, emotional involvement, compassion, caring, unconditional love, is not getting any of this, the child. So, what the child does to compensate, the child creates an internal parent, a parent inside that's a compensation for the fact that there is no functioning external parent. So the child begins to parent itself. But you cannot be your own parent if you are not also a child. So when, the minute you have an internal parent, you also have an internal child. And then the parent part parents the child part. The parent part becomes the parent of the child part. Mm -hmm. And then within the, the codependent, there are these two parts, the child part and the parent part. The parent part inside the codependent is a bad object. It's a punitive parent. It's a parent that is always criticizing, always demeaning, always humiliating, always shaming, always doubting, and so on. It's a, the parental side, the parental part in the codependent reflects the real parents. The child doesn't know any other form of parent. The child knows only the parents that it has. So it internalizes these parents as they are. These are bad parents. So he has a bad parental part. And this bad parental part is obstructive, is sabotaging the child, hates the child. The, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the child part inside the codependent is trying to please the parent part inside the codependent. The child mm -hmm. part in the codependent is trying to avoid the punishment of the parent child, the parent part. Parent, mm -hmm. yeah. So there is a parent part and a child part. The parent part is very bad parent and the child part is trying to walk on eggshells, trying to behave in a way that will not trigger the parent part to be punitive to, and so on. What happens is that this dual role of parent and child, this is the only relationship that the codependent knows. This is her only experience of a relationship. And it is an internal experience, not external. The only relationship the codependent is aware of, the only relationship she's ever experienced was inside herself between the parent part, which is a bad, threatening, mm -hmm. hateful parent, and the child part, which is terrified, intimidated, frightened, people-pleasing, trying to avoid conflict. And this is the only relationship the codependent knows. So when she comes across an intimate partner, she is trying to replicate the, re the only relationship she knows. She is trying to mm -hmm. convert the intimate partner into a mm -hmm. parent figure, and mm -hmm. she's trying to become a child. Mm -hmm. She's trying to recreate the internal uh, process. Um, this, this, this is known in, in psychoanalysis as identification, identification process. So the intimate partner is forced to become the codependent's mother or father. And the codependent becomes more and more regressive, more and more childlike. And this is why she's dependent, because she becomes childlike. 
and she pushes the intimate partner to become a mother or a father. And not only a mother or a father, but a mother or a father who is in control, mother or father who are um, uh, limiting her and criticizing her and controlling her. And so this is the only type of relationship she's aware of. This is her internal dialogue. There is another complication here. When the codependent falls in love with someone, the parent part of the codependent is very unhappy. When the codependent mm -hmm. finds a, an intimate partner, the parent part of the codependent feels betrayed, feels abandoned. It's like the parent part says, you used to love me, now you love someone else. You are betraying me, you are cheating on me. You should love only me. So the child part in the codependent is trying to compensate the parent part. When she falls in love, when she has a relationship, intimate relationship, and so on and so forth, she immediately tries to compensate the parental part inside her mm -hmm. because the parental part becomes very angry and very frustrated that she gave up on the parental part and found someone else, that she is now having another parent, an outside parent. There is a competition between the parent part of the codependent and the intimate partner, who is now the new parent. There is a conflict mm -hmm. between them. So the codependent tries to prove to the parental part that she did not betray, she did not abandon the parental part. She is committed to the relationship with the parental part. And she does this by punishing the intimate partner. She becomes aggressive and punitive towards the intimate partner. She says, you see, I haven't abandoned you. My internal mm -hmm. parent, my internal father, my internal mm -hmm. mother, I haven't abandoned you. Here, I'm punishing my partner. I'm rejecting him. I'm So the, the typical codependent relationship resembles very much a relationship with a borderline, but for different reasons. The borderline approaches and avoids. The borderline yes. says, borderline says I, I hate you, don't leave me. The codependent also approaches and avoids, but not for the same reason like the borderline. The codependent approaches and avoids because the internal parent in the codependent wants to sabotage the external relationship. There is a competition between the internal parent and the intimate partner, the new parent. With the borderline, the reason the borderline approaches and avoids is because of engulfment anxiety. The borderline is afraid that the partner will take over, consume her, digest her. So she feels suffocated. She feels like she's dying. Too much intimacy, too much intimacy. And she runs away. So it, from the outside, it looks identical. Approach avoidance. Yes. And yes. Many, many, many diagnosticians make the mistake. They misdiagnose codependency as borderline or they misdiagnose borderline as codependence but the internal dynamic is completely different uh, i do agree i can uh, see this during the session with clients and this uh, inner dialogue um, of a dependent person it's so difficult i can i can tell um how how much energy they can uh, you know, they, they losing to cope with this, especially when the conflict is between the inner uh, parent and the, the partner. It's really difficult. And that's why I have also another question, because I think that can be the reason why it's so difficult for a dependent uh, person to try new things, to do new projects, to uh, do something just new, to set a... Um, a little bit higher goal because I can tell that uh, it's really difficult uh, for this personality to to do the things. Very Why it's like that? Is it the reason? The, uh, yes, yeah. this is this is the dynamic. But but it is true that codependents are indecisive. Very difficult for them to mm -hmm. make decisions. Yeah. That's why they want the intimate partner to make decisions. That's why they <clears throat> they are needy. They are needy because they cannot 
satisfy or gratify their own needs. They need someone outside to satisfy their needs. And they're, they're risk averse. They're very afraid of risks. Uncertainty, uncertainty. They have very low tolerance for uncertainty. Mm -hmm. They have huge, huge abandonment anxiety, exactly like the borderline. Mm -hmm. They have huge abandonment mm -hmm. anxiety. They react very badly to abandonment and rejection, real or imagined. Even when they anticipate, mm -hmm. they predict mm -hmm. abandonment, and they react as if it has happened. They catastrophize a lot. So they, they immediately see the worst possible outcomes, and they panic. They, many codependents also suffer from anxiety disorder. So they mm -hmm. panic. They are very insecure. They are insecure not only about circumstances and about the environment, but they're highly insecure about their ability to bond with the intimate partner, to keep the intimate partner in their lives. They always anticipate rejection and abandonment, like the borderline. But they're also insecure about who they are and their identity, mm -hmm. their core identity. Mm -hmm. Because there is essentially a split in the personality between a parent part and a child part, there is really no cohesive, coherent core identity. Mm -hmm. They're truly, the identity is in flux all the time. And at any given moment, the parent can take over or the child can take over and it's pretty, pretty unpredictable. So, uh, by the way, th those of you who would like to study or learn more about this, you could uh, read work on internal family system theory, on transactional analysis theory. Oh, yes. Yeah. And you can even go to the earliest writings in Gestalt, uh, Pearls and his wife, and so on. This, con this conceptualization of parent and child parts who are at conflict is not mine. It's not new. It's uh, pretty, pretty common in many psychological schools. So when you have a parent part and a child part, and the parent part is not your friend, the parent part is harsh, critical, obstructive, hateful, um, rejects you internally, always criticizes you, doesn't stand on your side, doesn't have your back, sabotages your work and your hopes and dreams and so on. When you, when you have an internal enemy who is also your parent, it's very difficult to make decisions. Very difficult to, if you try to satisfy your needs, the parent part will say, you are spoiled. You're, you're self-indulgent. If you try to buy something for yourself, if you buy, if you try to, find a partner to be happy with. If you try to learn something new, immediately the parent part will tell you, don't do it, you will fail, you're stupid, you're ugly, you're unlovable, you shouldn't buy this thing because you don't deserve it, you're spoiled, you don't think far in advance, you don't see the consequences of your actions, be very careful, etc. This internal, constant internal voice known known in object relation theories, it is known as the bed internalized or introjected bed object. This group of voices inside you that keep sabotaging you make it very difficult for the codependent to decide, to be decisive, make it difficult for her to cater to her own needs, make it difficult for her to love herself. And so this is one part. The second part is the child. The codependent can either be the hateful parent or the helpless child. These are the two modes of the codependent. Sometimes she's a hateful parent and sometimes she's a helpless child. Of course, a helpless child should not make decisions. A, mm -hmm. a helpless child doesn't know what is good for, for it. A helpless child should rely on others, for example, on the intimate partner to tell them what is real and what is not, what is good and what is not, what is right and what is wrong. So both parts of the codependent paralyze her. They simply paralyze her. They don't allow her to exist independently, only through someone else. 
And even when she finds someone else, the parent part is very unhappy because the parent part wants the codependent to be dependent. The parent part wants the codependent to be dependent on the parent part. So the parent part is very unhappy when there is an intimate partner who loves the codependent and helps her. Because that means the codependent is no longer dependent on the parent part. This is very important to understand, and I will finish this answer. The dependency of the codependent is not so much on outside people. The dependency on the co of the codependent is on the internal dynamic between a hateful parent and a helpless child. She depends mm -hmm. on this dynamic. What she does is she externalizes this dynamic. She simply externalizes it, like she externalizes everything else. She externalizes ego functions. So she externalizes this dynamic and imposes it or superimposes it on an intimate partner. Now she says, this internal dynamic will become external. You will be the parent. I will be the child. I will be helpless. I will be needy. I will be clinging. And because I'm helpless and needy and clinging, you will serve my needs. You will cater to my needs. We call this phenomenon control from the bottom. The codependent mm -hmm. controls her intimate partner via emotional blackmail. Oh, yes. She comes to the intimate partner and she says, I can't live without you. If you go away, I'll commit suicide. I will die. Or she tells the intimate partner, I am so helpless. I don't know how to do this. Only you can do this for me. So this is emotional blackmail. And she uses it to control the partner, but she controls him from a position of submissiveness, from a position of the bottom, from a position of a baby or a child. Because the partner, the intimate partner of the codependent feels obligated to help this child. How can you abandon a child? How can you neglect a child? That's not okay. And the codependent becomes the intimate partner's child. And that way she controls. In the codependent has a problem with what is known as secure base. The mm -hmm. mother of the codependent or the parents of the codependent did not make her feel safe. She um, didn't feel safe with them. She couldn't feel secure. So she learned, I'm saying she because until recently majority were women. Although today many, many more men are diagnosed with, codepend with dependent personality disorder. Anyhow, because she didn't have the experience of feeling safe with mother and father, there was no secure base. What she learned, the lesson she learned is the only way to feel safe is to control someone. If I'm in control, I can feel safe. So I need to control. How can I control? By becoming helpless by becoming childlike, by becoming needy. That way I can control. And when she fails to control, the codependent actually becomes aggressive and even sometimes violent. And that is also very reminiscent of the borderline. The control part is externalized. The codependent tries to control someone outside. The aggression part is sometimes internalized, and then the codependent becomes depressive, and so on. Thank you for that, and I do agree. Working um, with uh, transaction analysis, I can tell that it's helping, especially dependent personalities, uh, to to understand this dynamic, this inner dialogue. And it's, uh, I can I can tell that you can see results uh, with this approach to help these personalities. Uh, I have two questions, but I don't uh, know that if we still have uh, uh, enough time. But the, the, the another question is, what are the similarities and differences between dependent personality and covert uh, NPD? Because I don't know why, but people sometimes are, especially when I can see on YouTube the comments or the messages that I received, 
they they confusing these two personalities. They're can you can you? Yeah, they're confusing mm -hmm. for good yes, reason. Uh, for good reason, because externally they look the same. They are fragile. Mm -hmm. They're vulnerable. They're shy. They're reticent. They they are avoidant. Yeah. So yes. externally, you could easily confuse a covert narcissist with a border with a codependent, and with a borderline, yes. by the way. But yes, the dynamics are totally different. The covert narcissist is driven by grandiosity. Mm -hmm. Frustrated, frustrated grandiosity, a state at a state that is known as collapsed narcissism. The covert mm -hmm. borderline is someone who believes that he is godlike, that he is amazing, unique, unprecedented, a genius, a super covert NPD. A covert NPD. Uh, did yeah. I say covert? Covert NPD. Yes, the covert narcissist believes all this. It's just that the environment doesn't provide this feedback. He believes that he's a genius, but he's not getting any feedback from anyone that agrees with him. No one agrees with him. And this frustration that he knows that he's godlike, but no one else does, this frustration creates a lot of passive aggression. So the covert borderline is envious. The covert, I'm sorry, narcissist, is envious. Yes, thank you. Is envious, is aggressive, passive aggressive, and so on and so forth. All this is missing with the with the codependent the codependent is not grandiose on the very contrary it's the opposite of grandiose the codependent doesn't seek external feedback in order to sustain an inflated fantastic self-image she seeks external feedback in order to regulate her internal environment it's it, these are two totally different phenomena so the therapist should go deep into the motivation into the internal world oh, because yeah. To observe only behaviors it would it often leads to misdiagnosis. And it is, mm -hmm. that is the big problem of the DSM. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is behavior-based. It describes behaviors. And that's a huge mistake because CPTSD, people with complex trauma, borderlines, covert narcissists, and codependents share 90% of the same behavior. So how would you diagnose? You have to talk to them. At some point, the covert narcissist would tell you how great he is, how godlike he is. At some point, the codependent will tell you about the battle between the internal parent and the internal child. At some point, the borderline will tell you how afraid she is to get too close to someone, how terrified she is of intimacy. At some point, the person with complex trauma will describe a pattern of regular abuse and regular trauma over a long period of time. You need to go deeper. It's not enough to observe behavior. I do agree. And thank you absolutely for that and for describing these three personalities because this is the main foundation, the intention, the motivation, only observing the outside, it's not enough. That's why we cannot, and especially I'm speaking to Polish community, we cannot judge someone only by uh, observing the uh, behavior we just have to ask so just um, yeah i think it's important to to you know let this diagnosis to clinicians and uh, not to yes. judge only about that. <laughs> because right. it's 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 not uh, okay maybe um yeah we can make it how can people with this personality dependent can help themselves or how can they cope with this only therapy the, only therapy right? only therapy. because each time they enter an intimate relationship they're triggered codependency becomes worse with time the more intimate relationships you have the worse the codependency becomes because many of these relationships end in trauma so the trauma creates even worse codependency. It's the same dynamic in borderline, same dynamic in narcissism. People need to stop diagnosing other people if they are not qualified to do so. People need exactly. to stop treating themselves through online self-styled experts and coaches and other nonsense. People need to yeah. go to clinicians and professionals to get help. This is not... A, a matter of common sense. You can't be treated by your grandmother or by a good friend. You can get a lot of support, a lot of succor, but treatment is a structured process of reorganizing the furniture in the living room of your mind. 
and only an expert knows how to do this. Thank you for that. And I'm so grateful, Sam, and so happy that we can uh, learn from you for free. Thank this you. is such an uh, honor. And uh, I can tell that Polish people are also really grateful because I received a lot of messages and comments. So thank you. Thank you for really. having me.